2 Corinthians. Turn to 2 Corinthians, chapter 11. That's our base from where we're launching the ship from this morning. And uh, boy, I had a I had a good time studying last night, preparing for. Um, this morning, uh, they say old habits are hard to break. <clears throat> My study habits, they have changed over the years, but some of them are still the same. Um, when I first got into pastoring back in 1990, um, that's back before cell phones and everything else. I had the hardest time convincing Caleb yesterday about, I don't remember what brought the year 1973 up, but we were talking about what it was like in 1973, and I had the hardest time convincing him that we didn't have computers <laughs> everywhere. I said, Caleb, computers in 1973 were these massive, big as, a, big as a house machines, yeah, that took up three floors of a building. And I said, uh, yeah, I hear that pop, Michael. And, uh, and I said, he said, well, you had cell phones, right? I said, no. We had smartphones. No, we didn't have that. We had a computer, didn't we? No, we didn't have a computer. Had the hardest time convincing him of that. Those were the days. And only how many channels on TV? Huh? And only how many channels on TV? Had five channels. Yep. And I was the remote control. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. And the foil and the Yeah. Right. And the fine tuner. Uh -huh. Remember those days? And he just he had he couldn't couldn't understand it, had, had no knowledge of that whatsoever. And then the older you get, you forget why you brought certain things up, like what I just said. I have no idea why I was talking about that now. <clears throat> Do what? Yeah, it was interesting. I have no idea what it was, though. You made us all feel old. Yeah. But, oh, study habits. When I first started pastoring, I, I worked full-time in construction, and... Um, so that didn't lead me all week to study. And so the Sunday sermons that I preached were all put together on Saturday. And um, I've pretty much had that same flow now for the last, however long that's been, 25 some odd years. And uh, so I had a tremendous time last night studying these things out and kind of adding to what we had started out talking about and uh, learned some things along the way, and I always like that. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Would to God you could bear with me a little of my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now verse 3 and 4 is the focus of what we're talking about. But I fear lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve. So we're going to go to Genesis 3 here in a minute. As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Your minds, think about things that are corrupt. People of, men of corrupt minds, the Bible says. Uh, how the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Now verse 4, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Notice three things here. Another Jesus, another spirit, and another gospel. Okay? The, number, the pattern, the number is important. So let's go to Genesis 3. 
we're going to go and understand the genesis of this other Jesus, this other spirit, and this other gospel. And while you're turning there, turn to, turn to Genesis chapter 3. And uh, I had a thought this morning. And I, I had, it was joyful. I don't know if anybody else, I'm sure probably somebody has. But I don't know what led me on this thought. But I was thinking about Genesis chapter 1. And how the King James says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. I just was pondering that. You know, kind of your mind draws a picture of what that looks like. And my mind drew the picture of wind blowing across the top of the, of the ocean. And it stirs up the waters, you know. And then I got to thinking about that. You know, in the beginning, verse 1 of Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There's God the Father. In verse 2, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. There's God the Spirit. And in verse 3, and God said, let there be light. There's God the Word. All three of them are there. First three verses of your Bible have God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Word of God. And God said, let there be light. Four words. And in the fourth gospel, the book of John, chapter 1, John describes Jesus as the light. He is that light that lighteth all men that come into the world. First thing that happens to a baby when they're born, their eyes open and they see light. Now they don't like it. They scream and holler and everything, but they, they see light. So you have the Godhead, which some call the Trinity, right there in the first three verses of your Bible. All three of them were there. Isn't that neat? I don't know if you've ever seen that before or not. That just that was something new to me. All right, now Genesis 3, verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord had made. This is the subtlety now. He's, he's not going to speak directly. He's not going to say what it is that he's trying to accomplish. He's not going to tell the truth, the whole truth. He's going to hide what he's doing in his subtlety. And he, and he said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. That is a direct contradiction of God's word. He directly contradicted it. He lied through his teeth. Ye shall not surely die. So he's promising immortality here. And then he's promising Godhood. Verse 5, for God doth know, he has a secret doctrine. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, that's illumination, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Little g gods, not God, not big g God, little g gods. In other words, you're going to be like devils. That's what he means. Okay, you're going to be an immortal being and you're going to have powers beyond the limitations of human beings. Now understand how important this Bible is and what it says, how it says it in the day that you and I are living right now. I found a story this morning. I come in here to the church, sit down, drink my coffee and pull up some news and... Bada boom, bada bing. There's a news story that fits right in with this Sunday school lesson. Y'all come on in, have a seat, make yourself at home. Okay? So we've been talking about the serpent, the beguiling serpent, and, and his nature and his character. Because he says, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. So we're understanding the nature of the serpent, who is the devil, the dragon, Satan, uh, Lucifer, uh, the wicked one. Bible says, and it just calls him by various names and so on. So we've talked about his nature, his character. Uh, we left off the last time with, uh, up there on the screen, how he demands or commands the worship of people. All right? Now, this next part, uh, take your, you, can, you can follow with me there on the screen or you can turn to these places in your Bible. I'll give you about 10 seconds to turn to Matthew 23. Okay? And this part we're going to deal with lost people are the seed of the serpent. I know what's making that noise. Let me, let's see if I can, uh, let's see here. It's 
this. All right. Nope. There. I think that's it. So there, you had uh, 15 seconds. Lost people are the seed of the serpent. If you're lost, means unsaved, you're wicked, you're, you're going to hell when you die, you're, you're, you're of that, Matthew 23, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. Okay? How can you escape the damnation of hell? 23 is the number for death, by the way. Okay? And if you read Matthew 23, you'll see the, the wages of sin being death in Matthew 23. In fact, that's, what is that? Romans 3.23 for the wages of sin? No, that's Romans 6.23. Anyway, the number 23 is the number for death. In Matthew 23, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Everybody who is lost automatically qualifies for the damnation of hell. If you're lost and you do not have the regeneration of God Almighty being your father, you are doomed to a hell that was originally created for the devil and his angels. That's where you're going. So, you serpents, you generation of vipers. Now, Ephesians chapter 2. Notice this. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. You hath he quickened. What does the word quickened mean? Be made, be made alive. You hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Somebody say amen to that. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. A prince is a principality in Ephesians 6. That's part of what we're wrestling against. We're wrestling against principalities. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in... Here is, here is your neighbors, your friends, your family members, co-workers, um, people at the gas station, people at the grocery store. Shoot, I'll even say some people that come to church. They are, by nature, children of disobedience. Which means that they do not have the indwelling Holy Spirit in them, leading them and guiding them into obedience to God's Word. In fact, they don't care about God's Word. They don't care about obeying God's Word. They don't care about church. They don't care about preachers. They don't care about the Bible. They don't care about righteousness. Have no concern about that whatsoever. They, they think that they are doing their own thing. But they're not. They are serving the serpent. He is the spirit that works in them as a child of disobedience. If you want to understand what's going on in this world, and if you are, in your nature, a conspiracy theorist, let me help you out. Number one, don't believe everything you see on the internet. Amen? Don't believe it. Number two, if you're going to believe in conspiracy theories, believe the ones that are in the Bible. They're not theories, they're facts. Okay? Number three, what, what would be number three? If it's not in the Bible, don't believe it. Okay? Number four. It doesn't take an, a secret organization called the Illuminati to make this world and everything in it go bad. It's already bad. It's not getting any better. You don't have to belong to a secret society, mystery religion, initiation organization, you don't have to have a secret handshake. You don't have to use secret words, secret codes. You don't have to do anything like that. All you have to do is be lost. Your lost family members serve their master. And their master is Lucifer. Their master is the serpent. He is the spirit 
that worketh in the children of disobedience. You, as a born-again Christian, have a different spirit in you. That is God's Holy Spirit. God's Spirit will lead you into places. God's Spirit will guide you. God's Spirit will sometimes drag you along in places you're not sure you want to go. But God's Spirit will take you there. God's Spirit will work in you, will correct you, will chasten you, will comfort you. That's what God's Spirit does for those who are believers. But if you are lost, if you have not accepted the grace of God by faith, then you have a different spirit in you. And just because your neighbor or your friend or your co-worker or uh, your, somebody in your family, your uncle, your aunt, your nephews, nieces, cousins, whoever, just because you, it could be your mom and dad, it could be your children, it could be whoever. Just because they're nice people, that does not mean that they're Christian people, does not mean that they're saved. And I'm not saying going around, well, they're, 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 they're serving the devil, let's kill them. I'm not saying that, okay? God's going to take care of them in the judgment. What I'm telling you is, do not be surprised at the actions of lost people. No matter how close you are to them, and no matter how nice they are on the front. I've, I've seen it with my own people, good people that died. But good people that die still go to the same hell as everybody else does. Because down deep inside, they're not good. And we ought to know that. We ought to know that down deep inside, they're just like every other man that's come into the world. They're by their nature a child of disobedience. They have been born with... You do not have to teach sin to children. That's in their nature. They have it bound in them already. Foolishness, the Bible says, is bound in the heart of a child. The rod of correction shall drive it far from them. And so, if somebody that you know or somebody that you care about is lost, do not be surprised when they turn on you. And they will, unless God is reserving them one day they're going to be saved. All right? Keep that in mind. They, they're children of disobedience. They are not children of God in the sense that they're not recipients of the inheritance of eternal life. They are, the, they are going to inherit damnation. Now turn to uh, Acts chapter 13. <clears throat> Acts chapter 13. Very, very, very important. Where's that news story I told you I had? Boy, you just wait till you see it. Acts chapter 13, verse 9. This is one of the, the, the first manifestations of the Apostle Paul as far as the power that God put on him and the ministry that God gave him. Paul, who is still at this time going by the name of Saul is uh, ministering to a, um, let's see here, who is he? He's in uh, verse 4, he's in, uh, he sailed to Cyprus. In verse 6, he's, uh, he's on the Isle of Paphos. And there is a man in verse 7 by the name of Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. So here's a man who is a, who's sort of a, a, uh, a ranking politician. And he hears of Paul and Barnabas and he hears the gospel that they've been preaching and he calls upon them and he wants them to come minister to him the word of God. And he wants to hear the Bible, wants to hear the word of God. There's still people out there that want to hear it, amen. And so anyway, uh, there is a one who is resisting that. His name is Elimus the sorcerer. He is called Bar-Jesus, back in verse 6. He is a false prophet. He is a Jew. And um, he withstood them in verse 8, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Underline that in your Bible. Seeking to turn the deputy from the faith. One of the, one of the things that lost people will do, they will mock, they will scorn, they will ridicule. They will blaspheme the gospel. Now, in front of you, they may sound like 
oh yeah, I mean, oh yeah, I believe in God. Yeah, I will, yeah, that's, and boy, Christianity is, is, boy, that's good religion. But behind your back and secretly, they will undermine your attempts at witnessing to somebody. And people, don't be surprised when it's your friend or your family member or work co-workers or neighbors. Do not be surprised at who it is. Okay? Don't be surprised. Everybody's trying to pin all the evils of the world on the Jews. Well, they're evil. I can tell you that. But you're next door neighbor and your kinfolk are not Jews. They're lost people. And they have a spirit working in them. And whether they do it in front of your face or they do it behind your back, they have a spirit that seeks to undermine your attempt at ministering the word of God to people who need it. Okay? You need to understand this. You need to understand that we don't love family before Jesus Christ. Amen. Nobody, nobody should come between you and your Lord. And I had a woman argue with me in Sunday school class in this room years ago who put family ahead of God. And I read what Jesus said about it, and she openly defied it. And I'm just going, I don't think you ought to do that. So anyway, but that's, that, was, that was his goal. Here's somebody who desires to hear the word of God. And there's always going to be somebody that you know that's going to defy it, whether they do it openly or they do it secretly. They're going to try to turn away people from the faith. So verse 9 is where we pick it up. Then Saul, who is also called Paul. I like this. Why is he now called Paul? Why didn't he just keep the name Saul? Anybody want to take a guess? Okay, that's not bad. Anybody else? Huh? New beginning. When you get saved, you get everything new. New name, new life, a new start, a new a new form of mercy that's new every day. So from Act chapter thirteen on, Paul Saul makes the transition to, to Paul, just like Abram makes the transition to Abraham, and uh, he's not called by the name of Saul ever again after this passage. He has a new name and new life and a new start. But anyway. Saul, who is also called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. You see the contrast here. He's, Paul's filled with the Holy Ghost. He is a child of the Most High God, a son of God. Set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil. Now that's not just a dirty name that he called him. It's not just a figurative speech. It's exactly who he was. Here's a lost person whose father is of the devil. All right, or is the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Now I want you to ponder that phrase, pervert the right ways of the Lord. Somebody give me the right, somebody name for me what you think the right ways of the Lord are. Give me some examples of that. Anybody? Huh? His commandments. His commandments. His pure word. That is the right ways of the Lord. The devil, listen to me now, everybody that's lost, everybody that's lost, will pervert the right ways of the Lord. Okay? The devil himself did it. He did it back in Genesis when he perverted the word of God, when he said, ye shall not surely die. He perverted it. Okay? He's perverting the right ways. The right ways of the Lord are, do not eat of this tree. That's the commandment of the Lord. Satan perverted it. Now we see that his children pervert it as well. 
This, I think, is of high importance to remember today. Because what I'm going to show you, if I ever get to it, I'm going to, I'm going to hold you here hostage until I show you this story. Okay? But I want you to think about that. The right ways of the Lord are His Word. And anybody who perverts the Word of God, that's a different spirit that they have in them. All right? Uh, Psalm 37. Let me read through some of these verses. Psalm 37, 28. For the Lord loveth judgment, forsaketh not his saints. They are preserved forever. But the, notice, the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The seed of the wicked is everybody that's lost. Everybody. Unless at some later date God is, has them reserved unto salvation, they are the seed of the wicked and they're going to be cut off. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers. The word seed in the Bible is always related to, number one, the Bible itself, and number two, DNA. I've, I've been all week amongst Amish farmers. And in all their stores where they sell their stuff, uh, there was one in particular, it was a little bakery. And uh, Lisa and I walked in, and it's an Amish farm, and they had a little bakery, on, like, like a little building attached to their house. And we walked in, there's about four young ladies in there running the place, and they were so cute in little bonnets and everything like that. I, there's no way in the world I was going to walk out of there without buying something. Mm -hmm. So I bought... It's downstairs. What I bought's downstairs, okay? So anyway, but they had a big sign on the wall that said, non-GMO. Amish, I guess, I don't know if that's a rule among them, but they don't eat genetically modified food. They don't eat it. They don't grow it. They don't use it, all right? And it's very important to remember that. Seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, should have think about that. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Lost people are a seed of evildoers. All right? In fact, watch this now. Lost people, when they reproduce, what do they make? Lost people. Okay? Humans breed, sinful humans breed sinful humans. Okay? My mom and daddy were sinful. And they birthed my sister and myself, and we are sinful. And we brought forth children, and they are all sinful, every one of them. Okay? And I had Roland at my house yesterday and all last night and this morning, and I'm telling you, he's got a sin nature in him. Okay? He's got one. Lead up with it. Who did he get it from? Got it from his mom and dad. Who did they get it from? They got it from us. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 20. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. God's going to do away with them is what he's saying here. Isaiah 57, 4. Against whom do you sport yourself? Against whom make ye a wide mouth and draw out the tongue? Are ye not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood? Now think about that. Think about, here's Adam, and there's Eve, his wife, and they're in the Garden of Eden, and they are in a perfect condition. They have access to the tree of life. They can live forever in the body that God made for them. And everything's fine until Genesis 3. And the devil shows up with his words, his poison. And when he speaks those words to Eve, she believes them in her heart. And now a change has taken place in her. Now she is contemplating sin. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Not only contemplating it, going through with it. Okay? So, when it says a seed of falsehood. Now we'll make this real simple. You can either be converted by the truth or you can be converted by a lie. 
Okay? Um, when you were young, you were taught that drinking was a sin. That was bad. Don't drink whiskey, don't drink beer, don't drink that stuff, right? And then what happens? Somebody converted you. Somebody talked you into it. Someone beguiled you. Spoke words of falsehood to you. And so now you drink and you think it's okay. You think it's neat. You think it's cool. You think it's the right way to go. See what I'm saying? You got converted. People sitting in their homes, minding their own business. Jehovah's Witness show up at the door of the Mormons. Next thing you know, they've reached into that home and made converts out of those people. They were converted with a lie. And they were converted to that lie. And by that lie. And outside of God intervening in their life. Like, like Brady. Outside of God intervening in Brady's life. He would still be a Jehovah's Witness right now. That God stepped in with the truth of the word of God. Okay. That's how it works. We go back to Genesis 3. Yea hath God said. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Ye shall not. And I, here's the exact words that Satan spoke in your King James Bible. Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened. Ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Forty-six words of falsehood here. Forty-six chromosomes. Your DNA is stored in these forty-six little barrels. Barrels of fun called chromosomes. When you were conceived in your mother's womb, your dad had 23, your mom had 23. They combined those together and make 46. This is so cool. If you look in Genesis 2, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I'm going to show you this new story before you get out of here. It's fresh. It's new. It's today. It's happening right now. Get ready. We're in the age of corruption right now. We are. Um... When at, in verse 23 of Genesis 2, when Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, she should be called woman because she is taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. 46 words here exactly. Which to me, it just it's interesting. Because these 46 words has Adam and Eve coming together to make one flesh, which is the recipient of both Adam and Eve's DNA. Okay? So watch this now. When you are born again, you can be born again of incorruptible seed or corruptible seed. One will give you everlasting life. The other will cause an everlasting death. And we'll preach on that this morning. Okay? Um, Matthew 13. Matthew 13 explains in parable form what I just told you. In the parable of the, of the wheat and the tares, the Bible says, He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That's the Bible. That's the DNA that God put in Adam was His Word. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the wicked one. You see it? Everybody that's lost is a child of the devil. They have his seed in them, his corruption in them. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. By the way, he's not going to gather together the wheat first. The Bible specifically says he gathers together the tares first and then the wheat. Very important to remember. The seed of the good seed is the Word of God. The undefiled, incorruptible Word of God. The King James Bible. When I was saved, it was this Bible. When God reached out of my heart years ago and brought me in, into my mind and my heart that this Bible was right, it was this Bible right here. But then you've got seed of falsehood. You've got all these Bibles saying all these things... I, I had something made for Lisa this week at, a, at an Amish store. 
And it had a Bible verse on it. And I told the guy, I said, now, I want this verse, but I don't want this verse. I said, I want the King James. He said, I thought it was King James. I said, no. I can tell you right now by looking at it that it's not. Because I know how my shepherd speaks. And it wasn't. And when he looked it up, and he went, boy, that is completely different than what I've seen in King James. I said, you better believe it. And, I, of course, I started talking to him then. Okay? Watch this. This just came out today. China unveils gene technology to create superhumans with hypermuscular test tube dogs. China, they had a video of it. China is creating, they're cloning dogs. And the dogs that they're cloning have been genetically altered so that they're muscular. Look at that dog. That is a freak. And I'm talking about the thing on the right. In case some of you couldn't figure that out. But Captain America, what is he? Genetically altered super soldier. They rewrote God's book of DNA in him. So now he is not human. He is a God. Because he can't be killed. He's immortal. He's the God. By the way, he's the God who was buried in the sea and rose again out of the sea, resurrected. All you got to do is watch the movie and you're going, okay, I get that. Okay? But we're living in the age of corruption right, right this minute, right now. Okay? They've made super dogs. Okay? Which, that was one of my favorite cartoons too. Wonder Dog, okay? But they made super dogs. The next step is super men. Okay? This is not science fiction, Sterling. Science fact. Right now, it's happening. Okay? And in this age, I promise you, every lost person on this planet <coughs> is going to receive this mark. Every one of them. If they're saved, they won't. If they're lost, they will. And they are now and will continue to be the enemies of all righteousness, including you. Okay? Let's keep it in mind. Father in heaven, help us to hold steady. Help us, dear God, to hang on to this book. Help us, dear God, to not be as many which corrupt the Word of God. Father, give us knowledge and understanding of the times that we live in based upon your Word. Give us wisdom, dear God, to know how to be and to know how to act in this crazy world we live in. Thank you, Lord, for this book being the guide of our life. Help us, dear God, to understand it. Bless its sacred words, Lord, in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.